I am doing a final check on mine. Where's all that noise coming from? Why is it? There's so much noise coming through my highly sensitive microphone. Okay, well, that's good then. I'll go back and unmute all the others. Wireless one, 152, 90 Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, especially the ladies down in front. It's good to see all of you. And it is time to take our seats and begin our worship service uh, of the Lord here this morning at Prairie View Christian Church. My name is Joshua, and it's great to see all of you here this morning uh, in the house of the Lord. There are several announcements. Many of them are in one of these bulletins. I finally managed to snag one. So here's a bulletin. It should have been given to you as you entered the building through the front doors. There's all sorts of announcements in there, and there's lots and lots of room for taking notes. We've got a lot of the book of Joshua ahead of us this morning, so plenty of room there. Uh, announcements that might be in there, we'll get to those in a moment, but uh, first allow me to welcome all the visitors that may be here. It's great to have you. Nearby, within a safe lunging distance, you should find one of these green cards. Later in the service, we'll be collecting an offering. When it's time for the offering, it'll be unmistakable, and you'll have the opportunity to put the green card in the black box up here. If you're part of the Prairie View family, that's when you'll give the offering. If you're not part of the Prairie View family yet, then just the green card, please. We will be celebrating communion this morning as well. So if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're welcome to celebrate communion with us. Uh, we do have the need for volunteers still in many areas as we try to get everything back up to full speed. Teachers, we've had some volunteers there. That's good. But uh, greeters, hospitality, tech teams, we've got plenty of musicians, but I'm sure we could find space for more of them on the platform. So if you're musical and you've been hiding that under a bushel, then uh, bring it out and we'll tell you whether that was the right thing to do or not. Now. Uh, we also have small groups starting in a few weeks after uh, Labor Day, and there is a couple of work projects going on. Now, out to the east, you might have noticed the two great big piles of sand. We've uh, got some sand. I've heard Mark said that there is a walk-behind loader that's coming, uh, like he thought I knew what that meant. And so apparently there's a tool coming tomorrow that'll push the dirt around and we won't have to worry about that and volleyball will be on. Now out on this side, apparently there's shrubs that are overgrown. I thought they were small trees, but not the case. We're gonna be removing some of them. So trucks, chains, 
propane, explosives, whatever we think we need to get those bushes out, talk to Mark and Nancy about that as well. Now, uh, on a more serious note, we're going to have a fellowship meal in five weeks. Sign up is out in the lobby for that. Uh, uh, the main course is being catered, so uh, the sign up is for sides, desserts, and beverages, and ice, of course. Now, uh, we have finally, finally retired one of our last COVID measures. The RSVPs are done, and we don't anticipate them coming back unless we go back into social distancing mode uh, and for the kids as well. So thank you for your 16 months of cooperation with our RSVP system. Nobody loved it, but it served a purpose and it was effective in its time, and we are not sad to see it go. Now, it has come to my attention that an apology is in order for something that I said last week. It was in the context of who should and should not come to church, and uh, you know, if you've got a fever or if you've got a cough or gastrointestinal distress, by all means, stay home. But then I also said if you're feeling peckish that you should stay home, and I'm sure many of you noticed that, that was not the right usage for that word and you kept it to yourself, but uh, my much better half said, I do not think that word means what you think it means, and sure enough, it does not. So if you wake up feeling peckish, then you start with a glass of skim milk, and you have a bagel or a muffin with butter, unsalted, and then a shooter of 2% and a large scoop of ice cream, and then brush your teeth, wash your face, and come to church, because peckish is not considered to be a contagious condition. It is easily solvable. So if you're feeling peckish, then... Uh, the means of your healing are at your own disposal. Now, with that, we are going to continue in our uh, sermon series from the book of Joshua, and we are well past the halfway point, and a lot of the action has taken place, or by the end of this next hour will have taken place. And uh, it's the sort of thing that you might expect to show up in Hebrews 11, where the author of Hebrews is talking about all the wonderful things that God has enabled his people to do by faith. Now I'm going to read here verses 29 through 31. We just finished 23 through 28, six verses on Moses. And then here, listen, how many times Joshua's name shows up in this paragraph. This is stuff that we've covered in the last few weeks. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. That was a long time ago. But the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. Same thing with the Jordan River. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. An animate object, the walls of Jericho, fell down by faith after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Out of all the money, wonderful deeds done in the book of Joshua, Joshua is not mentioned in the hall of faith, not because he was a scoundrel, but because his role was to inspire faith and action on the part of others. So as we uh, turn to the Word and sing the Lord's songs and uh, hear that, then um, Let's keep that in mind as we pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for the opportunity we have to come before you and to enter into this room. Thank you for the technological means that we have to worship, uh, even if we do uh, need to stay home, and if that's the appropriate uh, health-conscious thing to do. And thank you that we can um, have many means available to us uh, to promote our own health and safety and, uh, and to get us here in this building, in this space, so we can worship together and encourage each other together and hear each other singing your songs. And thank you that we can do that. And thank you that it's made possible through your son Jesus. That he made it possible for us to even be a church and to come into your presence. And he healed that gap that separated us from you. And thank you that not every uh, wonderful thing that gets done in your name is the sort of thing that has to be uh, written down and remembered. Uh, thank you that we can see examples like the man Joshua who uh, inspired the faith of others and helped others to do great things for you and helped others to grow in your likeness and in their walk with you. Thank you for um, people in this congregation like that, Pastor Mark, Pastor Zach, and Pastor Ben, and the hours that they put into um, the work of ministry, tending to your word so that they can bring it to us with life and freshness so we can understand um, what you mean and who you are and what you have to say to us and how we can come to you through Jesus and then live a life that is fitting with that. And I pray that our time together this morning will be in that pursuit and no other. It's in your name that we pray, Lord. Amen. I thought it was inconceivable that you would find a word that you didn't know the meaning of. But uh, upon your definition of peckish, I find myself a little bit peckish now really good ice cream in the morning. Nothing can 
can't separate Even if I run away Cause your love never fails I know I still make mistakes But you have new mercies for me every day Cause your love never fails I know
above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, oh, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and fill who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to go. Bounds in deepest waters, a sovereign hand will be my guide. Feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you never fail.
will call upon your name. Keep my eyes above the waves. The oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. For I am. Trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the water wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith could be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the water. Wherever you would call me, take me deeper than my feet could ever want. My faith could be made strong. we will take uh, communion and we will give an offering. Uh, you don't have to be a member of Prairie View to take communion, but we do ask that you be a follower of Jesus Christ. You will come forward uh, to these lovely black tables uh, and you will take your convenient prepackaged cup that has both the bread and the juice. Uh, you'll return to your seat and at, at that point you are free to take communion as you like at your own speed. Uh, also during this time, when you come forward, there are two black boxes here on the tables. These are for your offering. Uh, you don't have to be a member to give money to Prairie View either, but we certainly don't expect it. And as Joshua mentioned, there are the green cards in the seats in front of you if you would like to fill that out as a visitor or with prayer requests and drop those in these boxes as well. Um, now some of you are uh, probably familiar with the book of Leviticus as the place where Bible reading plans go to die. Uh, but uh, part of my job as a pastor is to study books like Leviticus, uh, and that's really and truly an aspect uh, of my job I love. Um, but to not give any false impressions that I'm, I'm smarter or more sophisticated than I am, what that study really looks like is me buying books written by people much smarter than me and then just trying to gain what they have studied. Um, one of these smart people that I'm reading from it has said that the theme of Leviticus is about entering into God's presence and surviving there. And, and I could talk your ear off, and at the risk of going into a mini-sermon, I will not. But uh, needless to say, the book of Leviticus is about entering and surviving in God's presence. And as you may know, that system is all about sacrifice. 
Sacrifices were brought to God for different reasons. We are most familiar probably with the idea of a sin sacrifice, and in some way all these sacrifices are tied to our sin, but there were lots of sacrifices, but all of them always involved approaching God. In fact, these are the kinds of conversations I have with my wife. I come home and I'm like, listen to this, and I I proceed to tell her how even the word for sacrifice has in it the idea of drawing near. So the old Hebrew word, and here I am being a nerd, but uh, the old Hebrew word implies that we are drawing near to God as we bring our sacrifices. And in some ways, that is still the exact system we have today. And praise God that we do not have to offer a sacrifice to come into the church. I'll spare the bloody details. Um, But we still require sacrifice, but it is in a radically different way. A sacrifice is still necessary for us to approach God, but it is not a sacrifice that we bring. In Jesus Christ, God has drawn near to us. We, we often talk at Christmas time about Emmanuel, God with us. God of the universe, unapproachable, only available at certain times by certain sacrifices. He has taken on flesh and walked among us. And not only has he taken on flesh, but he has offered himself for us once for all, so that we might be able to draw near to God. Hebrews 7.27 says this. It says, He has no need, Jesus has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. This is what we remember in communion. When we come forward and we take the, the, the cracker and we take the juice, We remember that this God who demands sacrifice for us to be near to, this God has himself drawn near to us and become the sacrifice. His presence is as real to us as this cracker and this juice are when we hold it in our hands. By the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, we are saved from our sins, we are forgiven, and we can enter into God's presence, we can have God's presence enter into us, and we can live. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Sunday mornings. Thank you for the time that you have, you have given to us, that you have taught or instructed us in to gather together to worship you. Um, Father, help us to remember that as we gather here, for as much as we offer our service and as much as we want to offer our lives and as much as we ought to live and look like Christ, that it all starts and it's finished by what we celebrate in communion, that you drew near to us, that you sent your son to take on flesh, to live among sinners like us so that we could survive in your holy presence. God, help us to remind, or just remember the love and the grace and the mercy and the justice that you've shown. Help us to never forget what communion is about and, and that the cross demonstrates your great love for us, your great power over all things. And the great confidence that we have as Christians, not to just walk out of here and and go about our lives, but to walk out of here with you going with us and to walk out of here in your presence, knowing that you are the God of the universe who did not spare his own son, but freely gave him for us. God, I pray for the rest of our time together uh, that it would be worshipful. And I pray as well for um, just the resources you give to us and the offering that we bring, that it's, it is not to be made right with you, but it's to worship you, it's to serve you, it's to give back uh, joyfully what you've given to us as an act of thanks. And we have every reason to be thankful because of your son. It's in his name I pray, amen.
morning again. Thanks for joining us at Prairie View Christian Church. If someone asked you, what is the single greatest thing that you have ever seen, the sun would be a really good answer. That's because according to NASA, the sun is the largest object in our solar system, comprising 99.8% of the system's mass. For comparison, if the sun were the size of a door, then planet Earth would be the size of a nickel. The sun's core is estimated to be 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. Meanwhile, its surface at a meager 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, is hot enough to boil diamonds. But not only is the sun awe-inspiring, it's essential for our survival. If we get too close to it, we fry. If we get too far from it, we freeze. Without it, we die. That's why many doomsday prophets center their predictions around the sun burning out. So if you put it all together, you can understand why many in the ancient world, and some still today, would worship the sun. I mean, come on. What could possibly be greater? Open up to Joshua chapter 10. Feel free to use the Bibles we have here if you didn't bring one, and take a Bible home if you don't own one. But before we read, let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you for the beautiful weather that we have. Uh, Thank you that the sun doesn't feel quite as hot as it has the past week, uh, this morning and the next few days. Uh, But Lord, thank you for the creation that you've given us uh, that we get to enjoy Uh, Thank you for the ways that you take care of us, the ways that you provide for us and sustain us uh, every single day, ways that we don't think about, ways that we don't often thank you for. And Lord, thank you for the opportunity to worship you here today by name, that we know who you are because you've revealed yourself to us in your word. And we have the privilege and the joy and even the responsibility to, to read your word to understand who you are, and rejoice that we have the honor of knowing who you are. And even further than that, uh, we have the honor of being your children. And so, Lord, I pray that our worship would be honoring to you today, uh, that it would be good for us, and that you would be glorified here in this place at this time. We thank you for your Son, Jesus. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for this church. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the last time we read the book of Joshua, God's chosen people of Israel learned a valuable lesson, but they did learn it the hard way. In chapter 7, we saw that if the Israelites tried to conquer the promised land without God's presence, they had no chance. When they attacked the podunk town of Ai, a city they should have had no problem defeating, they lost. Now, if they had consulted with God before the battle, maybe they would have known that God's presence was not with them due to sin within the camp. But once Joshua and the elders of Israel realized what had gone wrong and separated themselves from the sin that plagued their nation, things went much more smoothly in chapter 8. But did Israel really learn their lesson? Chapter 9 doesn't look too promising. The Israelites are deceived by some of the inhabitants of the promised land, namely a group of people called the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites had heard that Israel was coming and feared for their lives, but they took a more clever approach than walls or war. They dressed down, they made themselves look pathetic, And they told Joshua that they were from a faraway land. They begged for mercy. They offered to be Israel's servants, and the Israelites comply. Now, what's the problem with that? Chapter 9, verse 14. 
So the men took some of their provisions, referring to the Gibeonites, but did not ask counsel from the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the leaders of the congregation swore to them. Now, eventually the truth would come out, but Israel couldn't go back on the covenant that they had made. Like it or not, they have a new ally in the promised land. But once again, the Israelites fell into error because they did not consult God before they did something. So yet again, you have to ask, did they really learn their lesson? Apparently not. That sets the stage for chapter 10, starting in verse 1. As soon as Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had captured Ai and had devoted it to destruction, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, he feared greatly, because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than I, and all its men were warriors. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Haham, king of Hebron, to Param, king of Yarmouth, to Japhia, king of Lachish, and to Debir, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me, and let us strike Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the people of Israel. Then the five kings of the Amorites the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Yarmouth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon gathered their forces and went up with all their armies and encamped against Gibeon and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp in Gilgal, saying, Do not relax your hand from your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us, for all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the hill country are gathered against us bunch of hillbillies. Verse 7. So Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. So Joshua came upon them suddenly, having marched up from Gilgal all night. And the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel, who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon, and chased them by the way of the ascent of Beth Haron, and struck them as far as Azekah and Makedah. And as they fled before Israel, while they were going down the ascent of Beth Haron, the Lord threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died because of the hailstones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. This is the first time that the inhabitants of the promised land have banded together against Israel. These five Amorite kings attack Israel's new ally, the Gibeonites, which drew Israel into a fight. But that was a bad idea. Clearly, these kings haven't learned their lesson either. The Lord is with Israel. The Lord throws their armies into a panic. The Lord literally strikes them down from above. So to say that the battle was one-sided would be an understatement. Likewise, to attribute the victory to Joshua or the Israelites would be inaccurate. This is God's victory. The most effective weapon, hailstones from the sky, could be legally classified in our day and age as an act of God. Now, of course, God's done this sort of thing before. One of the plagues that he executed against Egypt during the Exodus was destructive hailstones that somehow, coincidentally, I'm sure, struck everyone but the Israelites. 
That was nothing short of a miracle back then. And so is this. But if you think that the hailstones are impressive, just wait until you see the grand finale. Verse 12. At that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord. In the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Aijalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Yashar? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. So Joshua returned, and all Israel with him, to the camp at Gilgal. That's an incredibly bold prayer from Joshua, isn't it? He even issues that prayer in the sight of all the people. If God does not come through, Joshua may have egg on his face. Son, stand still. I mean, shouldn't Joshua have been a bit more modest? He could have just asked for a few more hailstones or maybe even a bolt of lightning mixed in there. And just think of the utterly chaotic chain reaction that would occur on planet Earth if this request is actually granted. But God comes through. The sun and the moon stand still until Israel wins the battle. And we're treated to one of the most captivating miracles in all of Scripture. So it's just another rousing victory for God's people. The five rebellious Amorite kings are hunted down and killed. And as Joshua does it, he gives the people a strong reminder. One that shouldn't be hard to remember when you know that the God who controls the galaxy is on your side. Joshua chapter 10, verse 25. Joshua says to the Israelites, Do not be afraid or dismayed. Be strong and courageous. For thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. And while the fighting in the promised land is not completely done, Israel continues to rack up victories in the following chapters. So much so that for much of the rest of the book, Joshua's attention shifts from conquering the promised land to settling and distributing the promised land. But let's go back to our opening question. What can possibly be greater than the sun? Joshua 10 gives us the answer. The only God of the universe, the one true God of Israel, the God we read about in this book. The book of Genesis reminds us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth out of nothing. He made the two great lights, the sun and the moon. Turning again back to the book of Exodus, another plague that God executes on Egypt But again, coincidentally, I'm sure, not on the Israelites, is darkness over the land for three days. It appears that God has more control over the sun than you or I do over a light bulb. The psalmist put it beautifully, Psalm 19, starting in verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. 
In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The sun really is great. It really is glorious. But according to Psalm 19, it exists to give glory to God. No wonder God warns the Israelites in Deuteronomy 4 not to worship the sun when they enter the promised land the way the inhabitants did. After all, why would you worship the sun when your God is so much greater? One of the greatest theologians who ever lived was a man named Anselm of Canterbury. And some thousand years ago, he famously described God as, and this is one big phrase, a bunch of words in a row, all separated by hyphens, something than which nothing greater can be thought. I'll say that again. Something than which nothing greater can be thought. Put another way, Anselm is saying that God is that than which it is impossible to think of anything greater. If you're thinking of a God who may be exceeded by something else in greatness, you're not really thinking about God at all, is what Anselm would argue. He's greater than everything, even the sun. And yet we often find ourselves taking God's greatness for granted. As one author puts it, the transcendent awesome God of Martin Luther and John Calvin has undergone a softening of demeanor. In other words, in our current day and age, we sometimes try to make God a little more manageable. Another author says, we must define God as the best possible. Otherwise, we are imagining a finite being, woefully limited by our own imperfections and hence undeserving of our worship. As Augustine put it, God, not the sun, not the moon, or anything else that we can even observe or imagine, God alone is the perfection of both beauty and strength. The perfection of both beauty and strength. And you know what's really awesome to think about? Is that this God, whose perfection of both beauty and strength burns hotter and brighter than the sun, who exists outside the bounds of time and space and is glorious beyond all compare, of little old you and little old me. By faith in his son, Jesus Christ, you can call this great God your father. How amazing is that? We worship a God who is greater than the sun. Now, another question. Be honest. Do you really believe that God performs miracles? Do you really believe that? I mean, hailstones from the sky with the efficiency of heat-seeking missiles, the sun and the moon taking a break. Can God really do that? Well, if we believe that God is as great as he says he is, something than which nothing greater can be thought, then miracles don't seem all that far-fetched. If we believe that God created the world out of nothing, sent Jesus as the fullness of God in human form, had him conceived in a virgin's womb by the power of the Holy Spirit, and then raised him from the dead after he died on a cross for the sins of the world, then giving the sun and moon a breather from rising and setting shouldn't sound all that shocking. This God who is greater than the sun performs miracles. But what is a miracle anyway? 
theologians and biblical scholars have had a difficult time nailing down a definition. What really is a miracle? Charles Hodge once called a miracle an event in the external world brought about by the immediate efficiency of God. In other words, something that God himself directly did. Others have identified miracles as temporary suspensions of the natural order of things by God. And the sun and the moon standing still would certainly qualify. But one of my favorite attempts to describe miracles comes from G.K. Chesterton. He wrote, the most incredible thing about miracles is that they happen. The most incredible thing about miracles is that they happen. They're kind of simply just unexplainable. But it's not always easy to believe in miracles in our hyper-naturalistic hyper-materialistic day and age. You may think of the infamous example of Thomas Jefferson's Bible. He left in all the moral teachings of Jesus, but he took out all the supernatural stuff. That was silly. That was absurd. No one can believe that stuff. We've learned so much about how the world works to the point of thinking that we can explain everything. And when we haven't seen the sun stand still for ourselves, it's easy to view a story like this as a mere fairy tale. But here's the thing. A great deal of our faith rests on the truth of miracles. C.S. Lewis once wrote, We seldom find the Christian miracles denied except by those who have abandoned some part of the Christian doctrine. The mind which asks for a non-miraculous Christianity is a mind in process of relapsing from Christianity into mere religion. Do we really believe that God works miracles? One final question. If we believe that God is greater than the sun itself, and that God has no problem performing miracles, how should that shape our prayers? How should that shape our prayers? If Joshua's prayer was so bold, sun and moon stand still, then why are our prayers often so tame? Now, it's true that prayer, like any good gift from God, can be misunderstood and abused. Jesus says in Mark 11, verse 23, Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass... It will be done for him. Verses like those can be twisted and misused in harmful ways. If you're walking up to mountains and daring God to pick it up and throw it into the ocean just for the fun of it, then you might be putting the Lord your God to the test. We need to be careful about not misinterpreting or misapplying Jesus' words. Christians would be wise to remember the words of 1 John 5, 14, that when we pray, we ask things according to God's will. According to God's will. But we should not let a well-meaning desire to not abuse prayer to cause our prayers to be too timid. Our God is greater than the sun. Our God can work miracles. May our prayers reflect that belief. Can God heal that person on their deathbed? Of course he can. He's God. Can God take away COVID tomorrow? Yeah, he's God. And yet our prayers don't always reflect that sort of faith. Our prayers don't always reflect that belief. 
May we not forget that our God is greater than the sun, that our God works miracles, and may our prayers reflect that sort of faith. You know, Joshua 10 is not the only time God does something curious with the sun in the pages of Scripture, and neither is the book of Exodus. If you look at Matthew chapter 27, verse 45, we read, as Jesus hangs on the cross, now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour kind of weird that there would be darkness over all the land from noon to 3 p.m., and yet that's what happens as Jesus is crucified. Matthew 24, verse 29, Jesus speaks of his future return, and he says this, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. And the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Apparently, this man, Jesus Christ, the one who got crucified in Matthew 27 and promised he would return after he rose in Matthew 24, apparently this man, Jesus Christ, is greater than the Son as well. One final passage is Revelation chapter 21, starting in verse 22. This is a vision of the days after Jesus' return, a vision of what we Christians have to look forward to. John writes, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. The sun and the moon once stood still in the past. And one day, when we stand in God's presence, the sun and the moon won't even be necessary. That's because we'll have something. We'll have someone much better, much greater, much brighter than the sun to give us light and life. And we will be with him forever. The five kings of the Amorites learned the hard way in Joshua 10 that you don't want to be on the wrong side of the God who is greater than the sun. And if you're a believer in Jesus, you can know with confidence that this God is for you. And if this God is for you, then who can be against you? And if you're not a believer in Jesus, I invite you to trust in him. This God and all of his majesty, all of his beauty, and all of his glory has provided a way into his presence. The body and blood of his crucified and resurrected son by whom your sins can be forgiven. You can be reconciled to the God who made you. And you can be adopted into his family as a son or a daughter forever. You know, the ancient Israelites may not have known what we know, that the earth revolves around the sun and not the other way around. But I pray that all of us would learn the lesson God teaches us in Joshua 10, that the sun, the moon, the earth, and everything else revolve around him. 
Let's pray. Father, it's amazing to think that you are greater than the sun because there's probably nothing in all of creation that we can see or feel that is more amazing than the sun. But again, this creation that we see and touch and taste and smell and hear, as great as it is, as much as it tells us about you, as thankful as we are for this creation, we also know that you are wholly, totally, utterly different than anything that we can see or taste or touch or hear or smell. You are beyond our full comprehension. You are greater than we can even wrap our minds around, greater than the sun. But Lord, again, thank you for revealing yourself to us so that while we may never be able to truly fathom every bit of the fullness of your glory, we know enough about you to worship you. We know enough about you to be in relationship with you. We know enough about you to respond to what it is that you've done for us. And so, Lord, I pray that we would respond rightly to what it is that you've done for us, that you are greater than the sun, that you work miracles, and that really the most captivating miracle in Scripture is not the sun or the moon standing still, as amazing as that is, but the most captivating miracle in all of Scripture is who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us, and that by Jesus' body and blood, sinners like us can be reconciled to you. So, Lord, thank you for that miracle that has happened. And I pray that we would give you the worship and the honor and the glory that you deserve in response. Lord, I pray that our prayers would reflect our faith in you, that we would not forget how amazing you really are. We would not try to tame you or contain you or manage you inappropriately, but that we would let you be you, that we would truly worship you for who you are, not for who we would like you to be, and that our prayers would reflect faith in a God who's greater than the sun, faith in a God who works miracles, faith in the God who saved us by your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, again, we love you, we honor you, we worship you. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing. Come thou fount of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above I praise a mount I'm fixed upon it A mount of thy redeeming love Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, but he to rescue from danger interposed his precious blood and oh to grace how great a debtor that daily I'm constrained to be let thy goodness like a better I bind my wandering Heart to thee, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. I'm prone to leave the God I love, but here's 
my heart, oh, take and seal, seal it for thy courts above. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy will. The streams of mercy never cease, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me song, melodious song, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I upon a mount of God's redeeming love. I praise a mount I'm fixed upon a mount of God's redeeming That concludes our service this morning. Thanks again for joining us. We appreciate you being here. If you have questions about who we are, what we do, our church, uh, we would love to have conversations with you after the service. Uh, myself or one of our pastors or elders, uh, we'd happy, be happy to get to know you and answer your questions and just kind of talk as well uh, and pray for you, of course. We just talked about praying bold prayers, and we want to be a church that actually takes prayer seriously and actually prays for each other. So if there's any way we can pray for you, please don't hesitate to let us know. Now, one final thing I will throw out there, uh, an announcement of sorts, kind of a challenge or a call, a ministry opportunity, really. Uh, many of you know Kellen Strauss. Uh, she's been part of our church for a very long time. Uh, because of various challenges in her life, uh, she wants to be here on Sunday mornings but does not have a ride here on Sunday mornings. Uh, back before COVID, we found a way to organize a ride for Kellen, and that worked out really well for a season, and then COVID blew it up the way COVID blew everything up. Uh, but we would like to restart getting Kellen here on Sunday mornings. Uh, so if you have any interest in being a part of a team that would rotate Sundays and find ways to get Kellen here on Sunday mornings and then take her home, uh, please let us know. Uh, we would like to get that happening again. Uh, we've talked about the possibility of paying an Uber or paying a Lyft, but before we just throw money at the problem, uh, it's a ministry opportunity for us as a church, for friends and family and brothers and sisters in Christ of Kellen. So if you would like more information about what that would look like and what that would entail and how that might work, uh, please contact us and we can give you more information and hopefully we can get Kellen here worshiping on Sunday mornings. So with that, I will close our service in prayer, and we hope you have a great week. Father, again, thank you for this time that we have together. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you. Uh, Lord, in the week ahead, when we go to our normal lives that are very unremarkable most of the time and very predictable most of the time and maybe even not all that great most of the time, um, Lord, remind us of how great you are. Remind us that we worship a great God. We worship a God who is something greater than which nothing can be thought. Um, even in the most normal days, even in the most unamazing moments of our lives, remind us of how great you are. And remind us of how great a privilege we have to be your sons and to be your daughters and to be your servants, uh, bought by the body and blood of Christ. Lord, again, remind us of how great you are, no matter what it is that we're doing, no matter where it is that we're going. Give us the boldness and the courage to tell others how great you are as we go to work and school and our neighborhoods and all other places. Uh, Lord, help us represent you well in the week ahead, and we pray that you, who have more than enough power to do so, uh, would bring us back here safely next week to worship you again, because you certainly deserve it. We love you. We honor you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
The king of love.